Chapter 6, Room 7 The cafe proprietor hastily disappeared into the kitchen with a tray of dishes, and to the annoyance of Penny and Louise, Gus Comstock loitered near their table. He picked up a newspaper and pretended to read it, but they could see that he was covertly watching them. He deliberately trailed us over here, Louise whispered. Penny nodded and did not risk making a reply, for she knew Gus's ears might be sharp. There was no question in her mind that the man had tried to discourage them from dining at the cafe, and failing, had followed to learn what transpired. His facial expression had disclosed his distrust of Lenvar. The girls tarried over their dinner as long as possible, but it soon became evident that Gus Comstock intended to outstay them. Convinced they could hope to acquire no more further information from the cafe owner under such conditions, they paid their small bill and left. As the screen door slammed behind them, they heard Gus's voice raise angrily. Up to your old tricks, eh, Lem? he demanded. I don't know what you're talking about, the other man returned. Oh, yes, you do. I heard what you were telling those girls. You're trying to ruin our tourist business. That's what you're doing. It ought to be ruined, he retorted. Let me tell you something, Gus snapped. You tend to your own business and let me tend to mine. Get me? If you don't. The girls did not catch the remainder of the threat, for the man's voice dropped to a low tone. Turning, they walked slowly towards the river. Well, we learned very little after all, Louise remarked in disappointment. I wonder what Lem intended to tell us. I mean to go back there when the coast is clear and question him, Penny declared. It's evident Lem and Gus are enemies, but even so, it strikes me that something is decidedly wrong at the old mansion. Otherwise, Gus wouldn't be so afraid of the cafe owner spreading gossip. All the mystery seems to center around room seven. Yes, Penny nodded. I'd like to take another glance at that place, but I suppose it's impossible. Mrs. Comstock will be on her guard. I feel uneasy about Laura remaining here under the circumstances. Oh, I don't imagine there is any cause for real harm, returned Penny. Anyway, we'll try to talk with Lem Barr before we leave tomorrow. Cloaked by gathering dusk, the girls stood for a moment watching the dark, swirling waters of the Cobalt River. As a motorboat laboriously plied its way upstream, tiny wavelets pounded against the stone supports of the old mansion. Along the far shore, they noticed several houseboats, which had been tied up in sheltered coves. All houseboats look just about alike to me, Louise remarked. I'd be unable to recognize Mudcat's property if it came floating right before my eyes. I fear Mudcat will never see his River Queen again, Penny replied. A pity, too. The evening air had grown cold, so the girls walked back to the mansion, entering by the kitchen door. They found Laura washing dishes and immediately lent her a hand to help. I'm tired enough to drop, the girl confessed when the last pan had been scoured. If you don't mind, I'll go to bed. Let's all turn in, suggested Louise. There's nothing to do in this one-horse town anyway. Laura's room contained a double bed and a narrow lumpy couch. Penny generously chose the latter, and without asking Miss, Mrs. Comstock, found extra linen and blankets in the hall closet. Laura loaned pajamas to her friends, and by nine o'clock, lights were out. Long after Louise and Laura were sleeping peacefully, Penny lay awake. She was unaccustomed to retiring at such an early hour, and besides, the couch was uncomfortable. She squirmed and twisted and could not adjust herself. Presently, the girl became aware of voices from another room. Mrs. Comstock was talking with her husband, and in the still house her tones carried clearly. I don't care if you don't like it, Gus, she declared. Laura stays, and that's all there is to it. She's the best worker I've ever had. You know, we can't get anyone here in White Falls. 
I've not nothing against the girl, Gus answered in a gruff voice, but I'm afraid she may learn things and talk. Already the old fool, Lem Barr, is trying to start trouble. What's he up to now? Trying to tell the girl's friends about room seven, but I closed him up before he spelt it. Gus, I'm afraid, the woman muttered. We might get into real trouble. Forget it, Gus ordered. You always were a worrying kind. Go to sleep now. The voices died away, and the house again became quiet. Penny lay with eyes wide open, staring into the darkness. What deep mystery could be associated with room seven, the chamber of hideous paintings? She reflected upon Laura's declaration that the eyes of one of the portraits had moved. But upon the face of it, such a claim was ridiculous. Presently, after determining that upon the morrow she would attempt to persuade Laura to give up her position, Penny rolled over and tried to sleep. She was just becoming drowsy when she was aroused again by a sound not unlike the creaking of a board. Penny sat up and listened. There it is again. This time she felt certain the noise came from the opposite side of the hall. She tried to make herself believe it was nothing unusual, that any old house was likely to produce strange sounds, yet the feeling persisted. Someone was walking about in room seven. Unable to endure the suspense, Penny rolled out of bed and tiptoed to the door. She opened it and listened. Everything was still for a moment, and then she heard the creaking noise once more. There is someone in room seven, she thought. Penny glanced back at the bed where Laura and Louise were sleeping. She considered walk, waking them and decided against it. Slipping into Laura's robe, she stole down the hall, pausing before room seven. She listened again and, hearing no movement within, cautiously twisted the knob. The door swung back to reveal an empty room. Moonlight streamed in through the window throwing a ghost-like pattern on the carpet and across one of the paintings. Penny shivered and drew Laura's robe closely around her. Suddenly she experienced an uncomfortable feeling that she was not alone in the room anymore. Yet certainly her senses were tricking her. The bedchamber was quite empty. Penny entered the room and turned her gaze to the portraits on the east wall. She could not see them clearly. Three of the pictures were heavily shrouded in darkness. A moonbeam shone full on the fourth painting, a likeness of a man with a red cap. And the flickering light made his eyes appear almost alive. The eyes were luminous, and it seemed to her that they were focused directly upon her. Suddenly, for no reason she could understand, Penny was terrified. Gone was her desire to investigate the room. She felt only the urge to escape. There's something here, she thought nervously. Penny backed slowly towards the door, her gaze still fastened on the painting. She failed to hear the footsteps behind her. Then, with no warning, she was grasped firmly by the shoulders. Do, 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 do.